Their face could not be seen. It was not because the light was insufficient, but because they wore a strange, full face mask set with a bloodstone. There was a narrow crack running along a level, but that did not even reveal the color of the eyes underneath it. Then, there was the other person. If the first person was a midget, then this one would be a giant. Seeing this person brought the word boulder to mind. Indeed, that person had a stout and massive body, but that girth was not born of obesity. That person's arms reminded observers of logs, while the neck which held the head up seemed as wide around as a pair of a woman's thighs. The head which sat upon that neck was squarish in shape. The heavy set chin, currently clenched closed, and the way that person's eyes surveyed its surroundings reminded one of a carnivorous beast. The blonde hair upon that head was trimmed short for the sake of practicality. That person's chest bulged mightily under their clothes, as though on proud display. Said chest resembled nothing so much as thoroughly honed pectoral muscles. Put more clearly, this was no longer a tender feminine bosom. This was the adamantite-ranked adventurer team composed solely of females, Blue Rose. The two of them were members of Blue Rose. One was the arcane magic caster Evil Eye, while the other was Warrior Gagarin. Climb approached them. One of the people he was looking for nodded, and then bellowed huskily, Yo, cherry boy. The gazes that had been slowly drifting away all focused on Climb once more, but nobody mocked him. Instead, they turned away once more, as though in sympathy for him. They did this because they knew that even for Mithril or Orichalcum ranked adventurers, showing the slightest bit of disrespect to Gagarin's guest was not so much bravery, but foolhardiness. Climb bore the insult and approached steadily. No matter how many times he pleaded with her, Gagarin refused to address Climb by his proper name. That being the case, the best course of action he could take was to give up and pretend he did not care. Good to see you again, Gagarin S.A. San. And Evil Isama. He arrived before the two of them and bowed. Oh, it's been a while. What, come to sleep with me, have you? Gagarin jerked her chin, indicating that he should take a seat. There was an evil, savage grin upon that square face of hers. Climb simply shook his head blankly. Gagarin said the same thing every time, to the point where it had become something like a form of greeting. However, she was not joking in the slightest. If Climb answered yes, even in jest, she would immediately drag him into a singles room on the second floor. Climb would be helpless before her irresistible arm strength. Gagarin, who prided herself as a cherry picker, was such a person. In contrast to Gagarin, Evil Eye faced stoically forward, her face unmoving. Perhaps she was eyeing Climb under her mask, but he could not be sure of that. No, that's not it. Andrasama bade me come. H.M.? Leader did? Yes. I come with a message. You might need to move out in a hurry. I'll explain the details when you get backle. However, Andrasama wishes the two of you to ready yourselves and prepare for action at any time. Understood. Still, you've gone to a lot of trouble for such a small thing. Gagarin's face lit up with a broad smile, and Climb remembered that he had something else to tell her. Today I had the good fortune of sparring with Stranoff-sama. The move you taught me then, the big downward chop, met with Stranoff-sama's approval. Gagarin had taught him that blow in the practice yard behind this inn. Her face split with a grin, as though she had been the one who had been praised. Oh, that move? Hee <laughs> hee, not bad, kid. Still, yes. I won't be satisfied with just that. I will continue to practice and seek perfection. You've got to keep training, of course. But you should also think about what to do if someone counters that move. Think of a move to continue from it. Was it coincidence, or merely a unity of opinions from a pair of first-rate warriors? What Gagarin had said was much like Gazef's own feedback. A look of surprise came over Climb's face at the similarity of their words. Gagarin seemed to have read his reaction the wrong way, and laughed, of course, you have to use that chopping move I taught you as as a finishing blow, otherwise it's meaningless. Then she continued, in truth, you need to pick a move from all the others out there that has universal applicability. However, you can't do it. 
Gagarin's words hinted at Climb's lack of talent. Therefore, you need to develop a way to attack at least three times in combination. That combo must be one that keeps your foe from counterattacking, even if they manage to defend against it. Climb nodded. Of course, that won't work when fighting many armed monsters. But against humans, that ought to be enough. While you'll be in trouble once your opponent sees through your attack patterns, it ought to be effective the first time you face any foe. Hammer them, hammer them, and keep hammering them. Understood, Climb nodded heavily. This morning, he had only managed to get one hit in on Gazef. On every other occasion, Gazef had seen through him immediately, and he had been counterattacked in turn. Then, could he lose confidence because of that? Of course not. Could he allow himself to fall into despair because of that? Of course not. It was the opposite. It was precisely the opposite a mere commoner like himself had been able to come that close to the strongest warrior in the kingdom, no, the surrounding countries. Climb knew that Gazef had not begun to show his true power, but to Climb, who had been walking a pitch-black path with no light in sight, it was a tremendous dose of encouragement. It was like telling him, your efforts were not in vain. As he thought about that, he fully understood what Gagarin was trying to say. He was not confident that he could develop a good combination attack, but he was willing to try. A flame had been lit in the depths of his heart. He was determined to become stronger, so that he could draw out more of Gazef's strength the next time he sparred with the warrior captain. Right, I think you asked Evil Eye about something before, didn't you? Something about learning magic? Yes. Climb glanced at Evil Eye. At that time, she had merely laughed at him from under her mask, and the matter had been forgotten. Asking her the same thing now, when nothing had changed, would only yield the same answer. However, kid. A muffled voice reached his ears. Her voice was quite surprising, even without removing the mask she wore. The mask she wore was not particularly thick, so it should have been easy to make out the qualities of her voice. However, there was no way to tell Evil Eye's age or any emotional inflections from it. At the very most, he could conclude that she was female. It was an emotionless, even voice that sounded both old and young at the same time. That was probably because Evil Eye's mask was magical. But why did she have to conceal her voice? You have no talent. Work hard somewhere else. She did not allow him any room to respond, as though there was nothing else to be said. Climb knew her meaning very well. He was not talented in magic. No, that was not all. No matter how hard he practiced his swordplay, how many times he bled and blistered and calloused his hands, he could not reach the level he longed for. Low walls which a talented individual might soar over were like insurmountable barriers to climb. However, he could not give up on working hard to surpass that unbreachable limit. Since he had no talent, he had to hope that his unrelenting effort would help him improve in some way. You don't seem happy with that. Having sensed the emotions under Climb's iron mask, Evil Eye continued, Talent is an inborn ability. Some people say that talents are like buds before they blossom, and everyone has talent, oomph. To me, that's just wishful thinking, something idiots use to comfort themselves. Even the leader of the Thirteen Heroes was the same way. The leader of the Thirteen Heroes. According to legend, he was just an ordinary person, weaker than anyone else. However, he continued swinging his sword even when injured, and he eventually became a hero who was stronger than anyone else. He was a mighty being who could grow without limit. He was talented, but it just hadn't flowered yet. It's different from your case. You've worked so hard, but that's all the talent you've shown. Not everyone has talent and the difference is blindingly obvious between the haves and have-nots. Therefore, I won't tell you to give up, but you ought to know your limits. Evil Eye's stern lecture was followed by a brief silence. In the end, Evil Eye broke it. Gazef Stronoff, he's a good example. People like him would be considered talented. Climb, do you think you can make up the difference between the two of you with effort? He could not answer. His training today had made him realize that he was nowhere near that league. All right, maybe he's not such a good example, 
Still, the only person I can think of whose swordsmanship approaches his was among the thirteen heroes. Gagarin here is good, but she can't beat Gazef. Hey don't compare him to me. Gazef's a man with a foot into the realm of heroes, you know? Humph. You're a heroic woman too, although the woman part is in doubt. As soon as Evil Eye's voice trailed off, Gagarin laughed and answered, Oi oi, Evil Eye. These heroes in question are monsters with unique abilities that have surpassed the realm of humanity, right? I do not deny that. Then I'm still human. Just an ordinary person who can't reach the realm of heroes. Even so, you're still talented. You're not an untalented person like Climb. Climb, you shouldn't be fixated on trying to grasp the stars. Climb knew better than anyone else that he lacked talent. Even so, hearing her repeat you have no talent, you have no talent was very depressing. That said, Climb had no intention of changing his life's goal. This body exists for the princess. For her, I will, perhaps she sensed a martyr's resolve from Climb, but in the end, Evil Eye scoffed from behind her mask. So you're not giving up, even after I've said all that? Yes. Foolishness. Utter foolishness. She shook her head forcefully, unable to understand him. Moving forward while clinging to an unreachable dream will set you on the way to destruction. You know that, right? I'll tell you again, you need to know your limits. I understand. You may understand, but you don't care at all, do you? The word foolish does not even begin to describe men like you. You're the type who dies early, and someone will weep for you when you do, am I wrong? What's this, Evil Eye? You're bullying Climb because you care about him? Evil Eye rounded her shoulders as she heard Gagarin speak. Then, she turned to Gagarin and grabbed her by the lapels while shouting, Will you shut up, you beefcake bimbo? Hey, you know I'm right, right? Gagarin was content to let Evil Eye hang on to her, while she replied nonchalantly. Evil Eye was speechless for a moment, and then she sank back into her chair. Then, she turned the topic back towards Climb. Start by learning about magic. Once you know more, you'll be able to understand how magic using enemies think. You'll be able to pick a more correct course of action that way. Won't learning all those spells be a bit much for him? Of course not. The fact is, there aren't that many spells which magic casters use. Just focus on the commonly used ones. If you can't even do that, then you should just give up, Evil Eye muttered. Besides, he'll only need to study up to the third tier. That shouldn't be a problem. I say, Evil Eye. We all know spells go up to the tenth tier, but nobody can use magic of such a high level. Yet you know about it. Why's that? Hmm. Evil Eye had a schoolmarmish look on her face as she fiddled around under her robe. Klein suddenly realized that the sounds around them seemed further away now. It was hard to describe, but it felt as though there was a thin film surrounding them. Don't panic. I just used a pointless little item. Klein did not know that the activation of that item was a sign of how worried she was about being overheard. All he knew was that Evil Eye intended to answer Gagarin's question in strict seriousness. Now that she had gone to that extent, he sat up straight in his chair. In ancient myths, little more than legends, there was mention of beings known as the Eight Greed Kings. They were known as people who had stolen the power of gods, and the tales speak of how they once ruled this world with that absolute power. Climb had heard the story of the Eight Greed Kings. While they were not too popular, given that they were only children's tales, anyone with a little bit of knowledge would know of them. In summary, the beings known as the Eight Greed Kings appeared 500 years ago. Some said that they stood as tall as the heavens, some said they looked like dragons, but in any case, the Eight Greed Kings devastated the nations in an instant, dominating the world with their power which could move mountains and part the seas. However, their desires ran deep, and they fought each other for their possessions, resulting in their mutual extinction. This story was not popular for obvious reasons, but debate raged over whether or not it was merely a children's fairy tale. Climb personally felt that it had been greatly embellished. However, a small group of people among the adventurers believed that the eight greed kings existed, 
and that they commanded powers beyond those of any in this modern age. The proof of that was a city within the deserts far to the south. Rumors said that it was the capital built when the eight greed kings conquered the continent. As Klein lost himself in his thoughts, Evil Eye continued speaking. Apparently, the eight greed kings possessed numberless powerful magic items, and the mightiest of them was called the Nameless Spellbook, at least, that's what people call it. That's the answer to everything. Ah. So those spells are recorded in that book? Indeed. They say that the eight greed kings of legend left that unimaginable powerful magic item behind, a book which records all the world's spells. Also, they say that due to some kind of magic, even newly developed spells appear within its pages as well. Klein knew of the eight greed kings, but not of this tome. He had a rough idea of how valuable this item truly was, but he remained silent and listened. We know of the existence of tenth tier spells because of this item. Of course, there aren't many people who know of the nameless spellbook itself. Klein gulped. Will, will you be searching for that nameless spellbook? Klein only asked that question because he knew that they were top class adventurers. Evil Eye snorted as though to say, don't be ridiculous. Humph. They say that the book is defended by powerful magic and nobody can touch it but its rightful owner. Apparently, it's worth as much as an entire world, which is a hint as to how dangerous it really is. I know my limits, so I don't desire it. I'd rather not die in a stupid way like the eight greed kings. Your leader is said to wield one of the weapons belonging to a member of the thirteen heroes, does she feel the same way? That's something else entirely. However, I only heard about it from someone who saw it before. I'm just unclear about the details. I think we've drifted off topic, but that's that. Do you get it now, Gagarin? After that, Evil Eye looked somewhat puzzled, which was quite rare for her, and then she said, Climb. Don't forsake your humanity in the pursuit of power. Forsaking humanity? You mean like the demons in stories? That's one way. There's also becoming one of the undead, or a magical being. Normal people can't do that. Which is true, but after you become undead, your mind often twists to go with it. When once you only acted to fulfill a passionate dream, the changes in the body are echoed in the soul, and you become a terrifying monster. The voice from under that mask was typically devoid of emotional inflection, but now it was tinged with a hint of regret. Gagarin noticed how Evil Eye was staring into the distance, and deliberately spoke up in a bright voice. Well, the princess would probably faint if she woke up and saw that Climb had become an ogre. Evil Eye had probably sensed the good intentions behind Gagarin's words. Her voice returned to its usual emotionless pitch. Indeed, that's a way to. Transmutation type spells can briefly allow you to change into another species. I'll be frank, they're valid options for improving your physical attributes. I think I'll pass on that. If you simply desire strength, then changing into another species is quite effective. After all, the human body is hardly exceptional, and the same abilities are more effective when one's basic physical attributes are improved. That much was obvious. Between two evenly skilled opponents, the one with the better physical attributes would have the advantage. The fact is that many of the thirteen heroes were non-humans. By the way, they're called the thirteen heroes, but there were more of them than that. However, only 13 of them made it into song and story. The battle against the demon gods was one that crossed all racial boundaries, and certain human-centric people didn't want to let the other species shine too much in the heroic sagas. Evil Eye seemed to be making a dig at certain people. Then, her attitude changed, and she continued in a nostalgic tone. The warrior captain of the air giants, and his axe of cyclones, the elf royal family, who bore the special characteristics of the ancestral elves, and the black knight who wielded the four swords of darkness, the original owner of our leader's Kiliniram, was also a human with demon's blood. The four swords of darkness, huh, black knight, one of the thirteen heroes, was renowned for possessing four blades, the evil sword Hyumalus, the demon blade Kiliniram, the sword of decay Croctable, and the death sword Sphys. One of those blades was in the hands of Lachius, the leader of Blue Rose. The demon blade Kiliniram, created by condensing infinite darkness, 
is said to be the mightiest of the four. I have a question, is it true that if it unleashes its full power, it could project enough dark energy to swallow a country whole? What are you talking about? Evil I asked in a confused tone. I once heard our leader muttering to herself, when she was alone. She held her right arm and said, Only a woman who serves the gods like myself can suppress its demonic power with all my will or something like that. I've never heard of anything like that before. Evil Eye tilted her head in surprise. Still, if the owner says that, it might be true. Then is there really a dark Lachius, born from the dark side of her spirit? What? Nah, I just happened to hear her muttering to herself again. Don't think she noticed me, so I decided to take a listen, and in the end she ended up saying, If you get careless, this being of blackness born of the source of all darkness shall take over your body, and release the demon blade's power or something. Sounded pretty bad. This, well, we can't rule that out. Some cursed items can control their owner's minds, things would be pretty dire if something like that happened to Lockyus. I felt that she was trying to keep it a secret, but this is something big, right? So when I asked her straight up, she blushed and told me not to worry about it. H.E.M. It must be pretty embarrassing for a priest, who should be the one removing curses, to end up falling victim to a curse herself. Perhaps she doesn't want us to worry? Does she really intend to bear that burden by herself? I didn't see her act like that again after that, but think about it. Didn't she start wearing all those meaningless armor rings on all her fingers after obtaining the demon blade? I thought she put them on to be fashionable, do you mean they're ceiling type magic items, or touchstones of some sort? Klein could no longer pretend to be unmoved, and he frowned. From what he had seen and heard, Lockyus might well be under the control of an evil magic item. He became even more worried as he thought about where he had just been. Will Renersama be in danger? Evil Eye stopped Klein before he could rush out. Don't worry. I doubt the situation will deteriorate. She won't be taken over unawares, even if the power of darkness threatens to take her over. We'll have to take the fact that she didn't tell us as a sign that she's confident of controlling it herself. I'm certain she has the mental strength for it. Still, I didn't expect the sword to have that kind of power. Even I've never heard of that before. Should we talk to Azuth for safety's sake? I'm not too happy about asking a rival for help, but, well, she is his niece, so we should let him know, at least. H.M., then shouldn't we do that right away? We still need to track him down too. M.M. We should just prepare ourselves to back Lockyus up at any time. After all, it takes an adamantite-ranked adventurer to stop another. H.M.? Ah. Uh, that reminds me, Gagarin. I heard that a third adamantite-ranked adventurer team was formed in Erantel. What? Really? That's the first time I've heard of it. Did you find that out when you went to the Adventurer's Guild this morning? No, ah, uh, yes. Sorry. I forgot to tell you. Their team seems to be black. Black? I thought we'd have brown or green after blue and red. Well, black is one of the colors of the six great gods. Nothing strange about that. Who knows, the next one might be white. I'm no fan of the slain theocracy. Actually, didn't we have a big fight with one of their special ops units? Klein sensed that he had overheard a pretty dangerous topic, but neither of them paid him any heed as they kept talking. Gagarin, you hate them? Well, they did try to kill me once, but I understand how they're thinking. Or rather, their sworn mission is to defend all of mankind. Isn't that proper, from the perspective of humanity as a species? Ha! Huh? So you mean it's all right to massacre innocent demihumans and elves for that goal? There was a clear look of disgust on Gagarin's face, and the flames of anger burned in her eyes. Evil Eye bore her anger, and shrugged. There's quite a few human nations around here, like the Kingdom, the Holy Kingdom, the Empire, and so on. But did you know, Gagarin? The further you are from here, the fewer human-led nations there are. All of them are countries composed of demi-humans or species that are superior to mankind. Did you know that some of them even trade in humans as slaves? 
The reason why there aren't any of those countries around here is because the slain theocracy has been going around and exterminating any demi-humans that pop their heads up. Gagarin's anger went out as she heard Evilai's words. Still, she was frowning as she replied, Well, demi-humans were always physically superior to mankind anyway. If they banded together and developed culture, humanity wouldn't be able to deal with them. Basically, all humans should think highly of the theocracy. It's true that they're ruthless, which is a demerit, but even so, nobody else has done more for mankind as a whole, of course, whether or not someone the few they abandoned could say the same thing is a different matter entirely. Besides, it's quite likely that they were the ones who originated the Adventurer's Guild. Seriously? Who knows? There's no telling if it's true or not, but the possibility is very high. After all, the Adventurer's Guild was founded after the battle with the demon gods, when humanity's strength had been greatly diminished. I suspect they were preserving their power, and wanted to aid the various nations without causing friction, and thus they set up that organization. Silence filled the table after the discussion ended. Unable to bear it, Climb spoke up, Forgive my interruption, Evil Isama. You said that new adamantite-ranked adventurers had emerged, do you know their names? H.M.? Ah, oh, right, I mentioned that. I think one of them is called, Mammon. He's their leader, a warrior called the Dark Hero. They haven't picked a name for their team yet, but everyone calls them Darkness. I see. How about the other members? I heard hers paired with someone called Nabe, an arcane magic caster known as the Beautiful Princess. Huh? Just the two of them? What's up with that? Are those idiots so confident in their abilities that, no, it's because of those abilities that they're adamantite ranked. Are they hiding some kind of secret weapon? Is that it? What accomplishments do they have to their name? Climb leaned in to listen as well. This was an adventurer team, which had obtained the adamantite rank. They must have embarked on all manner of adventures, which would set people's hearts aflutter. He was burning with anticipation, even before hearing a single word. All this was done within two months, first, they eliminated the thousands of undead which showed up in Erantel. Then, they exterminated the Northern Goblin Tribe Alliance, found rare herbs in the Great Forest of Tob, slew a gigant basilisk and eliminated a band of undead that had escaped from the Katza Plains. In addition, I hear they defeated an incredibly powerful vampire, a gigant basilisk, Climb repeated in a breathless voice. It was a huge monster that was almost ten meters long, like a cross between a lizard and a serpent. It had a petrifying gaze attack, its bodily fluids were a poison that could cause instant death, and its hard, thick skin rivaled mithril in toughness. It was a terrifying being, so being able to defeat a monster like that, which could destroy a town, was a perfectly sensible reason for being promoted to adamantite rank. However, there was one problem with that, that's amazing. Still, did they really do it with just the two of them? Surely just two people, being a warrior and an arcane magic caster, wouldn't be able to deal with a gigant basilisk, right? Doesn't seem possible to me. Indeed. It was almost impossible for just two people to do it, especially if they were a warrior and an arcane magic caster. How would they heal themselves? How could they resist its petrifying gaze, its toxic bodily fluids and its other special attacks? Ah. Uh, sorry, I can't really say it was just the two of them. I hear they subdued the wise king of the forest by force, and made it their minion. The wise king of the forest? What manner of beast is that? Climb recalled the name from various heroic sagas and similar stories. However, it would be terribly rude to interrupt right now. I don't know the details either, but apparently it was a magical beast which inhabited the great forest of Tob since times of old. It possesses matchless might. My colleagues once say yes, I don't think they encountered it, when they went to the great forest 200 years ago. Evil Eye shrugged as she mentioned the figure of 200. Such a number would not be anything out of the ordinary for forest elves, but given her attitude, Klan could only conclude that it was a jest of some sort. Oh ho. Then, how credible are these stories? They've probably been spiced up or something, right? 
It was always like that. Sometimes a tale was accidentally exaggerated in the telling, or corpses were so badly dismembered that one could not get an accurate body count, and sometimes adventurers just wanted to brag for fame. Thus, these stories often ended up embellished. In contrast, Evil Eye erected a finger, and wagged it with a TCH TCH TCH. Well, these stories seem pretty factual. The Erantal incident in particular, where that man threw his greatsword and slew an undead giant, then carved his way through a thousand-strong horde of undead. These reports came from the surviving guardsmen, and their accounts all tally up. Thus, I doubt there was any exaggeration of his exploits. They eliminated the masterminds behind the undead horde, and the corpses have been verified, and they destroyed a pair of skeletal dragons before that. Gagarin was speechless, and Clime asked her, Even you would have trouble with them too, am I right, Gagarin-san? If it was just several thousand zombies or skeletons, it'd be fine. I could smash my way through those. Even the two skeletal dragons might be doable. But I can't say the same for the masterminds behind the incident. I've no confidence of being able to deal with them if I didn't know their abilities. There are unofficial opinions which state that they were from Zuranon. Really, Evil Eye? Ah, if it was their disciples, then I'd be out of luck. It'd be really hard to beat them after fighting so deep into hostile territory. Make one little mistake, get poisoned or paralyzed, and the show's over for you. How did the two of them heal themselves? Potions, maybe? Who knows, that Mammon warrior might be able to use divine magic like our leader. Or perhaps that beautiful princess girl could use it. We can't rule that out, Evil Eye nodded in agreement. Still, a gigant basilisk. Yeah, I've got nothing. Enemies like that are too much for warriors, for any close-range fighters, actually. I've got the power of Gaze Bane on my side, but it'd be really risky without backup. Heard that, Climb? In other words, Gagarin can't do it by herself. In other words, it'd all be up to that knave woman. Maybe you could do the same if you were paired with her, could you? Ah, uh, it'd be easy if she was as strong as Evil Eye. If it were you, you could take care of it yourself with long-ranged combat, 